Ali Sidal, the second talk, the Yanis, the Honorim, and the intrinsic complexity in arithmetic. I was going to wish happy birthday to the birthday boy, but I don't see him. Yeah, there he is. And uh, I hope that in the second half of your professional life, you're as successful as you have been in the first half. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful examples. <laughs> the topic I'm going to, uh, the topic of my lecture is maybe not so familiar to describe, but it has the advantage that it's very easy to explain the kind of questions I want to ask by looking at a classical example that we all know, and that's the Euclidean algorithm. This is based on this uh, equation about the greatest common divisor of two numbers, and I'm taking A to be greater than or equal to B. If B divides A, then B is the greatest common divisor. Otherwise, you can replace AB by B and the remainder, and the GCD is preserved, right? The ancient Greeks knew that. In fact, they had a name for this operation on two numbers, whether you replace either by the remainder or by the subtraction. And of course, you can interpret an equation like this as a program, a recursive program. You check the remainder. And if it isn't zero, then you repeat the instructions. And the complexity of the Euclidean, the natural measure of its complexity, is the number of remainder operations. Calls to the remainder oracle or divisions, if you're actually doing it, uh, it's been analyzed uh, to death, but the simplest result about it, which is enough for what I want to do, is that it's a logarithmic thing. Uh, it's less than or equal to twice the logarithm as long as y is greater or equal to 2. And the natural question is, is the Euclidean optimal for computing the GCD from the remaining operation and testing for 0, which you need for uh, implement that conditional. Now, obviously, there are many ways to define optimality. Is it optimal on an infinite set or something like this? The one thing that's immediately clear is that the kind of algorithms with which you're going to compare it are not algorithms on a Turing machine, uh, because algorithms on a Turing machine, even if you say you can use the remainder as an oracle, you say, I don't want it, right? I mean, the GCD is a, is a primitive equation function. You can compute it in an entirely different way. So we need to formulate uh, this kind of question for algorithms for print from specified primitives, in this case the remainder operation and testing for zero, and not allow other primitives somehow when to restrict it. I want to also state it for coprimeness. If you can compute the GCD, you can decide whether the two numbers are coprime. Uh, but that might be a much easier problem, right? I mean, for example, factoring and primality is an entirely different order of magnitude in the difficulty of the problem. So if we're trying to show <coughs> to try to do a complexity analysis here, uh, doing an analysis for the coprimeness relation is you get somewhat better results. So this is basically the problem that I want to look at, not just for the GCD and the Euclidean, but in general for problems in arithmetic and algebra. But I'm particularly interested, certainly in this lecture today, not just in getting results, I will talk only about two lower bound results. Uh, but in formulating uh, the appropriate uh, framework in which we can establish results and have some either proof or some justification, some foundation analysis that they are optimal for all algorithms. OK, so this is the aim. We want to derive robust lower bounds. Robust means with respect to the model of computation, that is complexity theory when it's you know, we don't have a generally acceptable definition of what algorithms are. So when people make complexity analysis, they Turing machines, the Marxist machines, or whatever. Uh, but I want to combine it with some uh, analysis that plausibly the lower bounds in questions are absolute. Uh, so I have a few preliminary things. Uh, I want to talk about <coughs> functions that are computed from primitives on a certain set. And the easiest way to do that is in the context of a structure, a first order structure, if you want to. Uh, it has functions and relations, but we will allow them to be partial. That's useful in the uh, analysis every time you do computation. Now, I hope people don't get, I haven't tried this, 
many times. Don't get confused by this. I want to be talking about functions and relations at the same time, and I don't want to keep saying functions and relations. So we, I will look at first order structures as having just functions there, except the functions, sometimes they have a sort, right? They, they have an arity and they have a sort. If they're a Boolean sort, they're relations. So that's a partial structure. Here's an example. The Euclidean structure, which is actually total, has the remainder operation in two unary, the remainder operation in two unary relations, and you can get partial cases by restricting it to a, uh, any subset of the natural numbers. The diagram, which is the, not the elementary diagram, but the diagram that if we had a relational structure, we would say just the atoms, so to speak. But here we think of them as, as equations. The diagram of a structure is all equations that it satisfies. This W there is either a truth value if phi is a relation or it's a member of A if phi is a function. And for what I want to do, you really want to identify a structure with its diagram. If you have in some uh, points in there that don't appear in the diagram, all the functions are undefined that they won't play any role at all. So, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I won't mention that that uh, explicitly, but some of the things I'll write down to be true require that. So let me write down a sample result. It's one of the two results I'm going to talk about later on. Uh, Suppose I have a structure like this, so I have a set and I have certain primitives on it, and I have a subset of the primitives. Now the good example to think here is this is the field of real numbers, so that's the real numbers, that's plus and times, uh, division and subtraction, maybe they call it relation, and then phi zero is just division and multiplication, or phi zero is just addition and subtraction, right? Uh, and I want to compute a function on A, uh, the result will be that for each such situation of a structure and a function, there is an associated complexity measure called AFX. It's defined whenever F is defined. And what it does, it gives a lower bound for the number of calls to the primitives in phi naught that any algorithm computing F will do. Right, that's the first thing. Now, it could be trivial, of course, if this is zero, right? But it won't be able to explain in a minute what happens. So this is going to be a theorem for concrete algorithms specified by particular models of computation, including machine with oracles or random access machines. That becomes a theorem. And I will make a possibility argument that it's true for all algorithms, whatever algorithms of this type from primitives are like. The second thing is what I said before, that it's not going to trivial, this is zero. In fact, in many cases, and I will mention two of these cases, it gives the best known lower bounds for the particular problems. Right? I will look specifically for coprimeness from various primitives in the natural numbers and for polynomial testing whether a polynomial is zero in algebra as a function of the coefficients. I'll make that precise, but so so this is not a trivial intrinsic complexity. But notice the way this is going to be done, this complexity measure has nothing to do with algorithms. It's going to be defined directly from F and the structure A, meaning the primitives from which I'm computing. And uh, the results are considerably more general. There are many complexity measures to which they apply uh, other than this one. And the methods that I'm going to use are from abstract model theory. I'm not going to try to define algorithms. I mean, ideally, we would agree all on what an algorithm of this type is, and then we would just prove this thing straight out. But uh, that's a difficult thing to do. So the methods are going to be very, very simple. About half the talk, we'll talk about these methods from abstract model theory. And that's the justification for getting these results. Otherwise, I could, oops. This is a previous thing, yes. Otherwise, I could probably just go ahead and define these sort of things right now. But I'm going to take about half the talk, going a little slowly and trying to justify what happened. So here's the slogan. There is this, the, for desirable problems, if you say what are going to be your resources, in this simple case where I'm not having interaction or anything like this, the resources are given operations and functions on a set. 
there is a minimum amount of work that you have to do that has to it, it's, it involves how you get information from your structure about the function you want to complete and that's a logical property uh, so this is an outline of the talk the preliminary is actually is only one more page I've given most of them the main uh, part of the talk 10-15 minutes or so is about this notion of a uniform process which is an abstract uh, notion that it's the abstract model theory part of the talk and then I give two examples uh, of the applications of this one in arithmetic and one in algebra uh, for references uh, most of the work in arithmetic uh, all the work in arithmetic comes from two papers with one degrees there are strong aversions here in terms of this abstract approach, but the mathematics is all there. And the uh, algebraic results, I haven't written down, but there's a set of notes which should be on my homepage by next week if you're interested, that's where all the proofs are. You'll be amazed how few lower bound results in arithmetic exist. It's, uh, I was quite amazed when we got involved in this uh, about 10 years ago. So for arithmetic, these three papers, basically, for, specifically for coprimeness and GCD computation, is the only paper we could find in the literature. As far as I know, these are the only papers that are still there. That's not true in algebra. Uh, uh, there is a huge number of, of results in uh, algebraic complexity, in lower bound results, not just developing algorithms. And I'm only going to touch this subject very lightly. Here are papers that are very relevant to the problem I'm looking at rather than general books. So in terms of preliminaries, this is the little bit more that I need. I'm going to be looking at substructures. A substructure is not closed under the primitives. I want to allow finite substructures, right? So for example, if you have the natural numbers, the structure of piano arithmetic with plus and times, you might have a substructure that only has in it the object 0, 1, and 2, and only one equation, 1 plus 1 is 2. That's a substructure, OK? So it's, we're taking them more like graphs rather than anything else. Uh, and a homomorphism is defined just like a graph homomorphism would, uh, would be defined if I have two substructures. A homomorphism is a map, of course, uh, which preserves in one direction the equations in the diagram. It's an embedding if it's one to one. Finite substructures are used to capture calls. An algorithm think of your favorite kind of computation uh, model, as it computes, it asks from the oracle certain questions, it's going to stop, and at some point it would have asked only so many questions. So it lives in this finite subalgebra for that particular input. That's the way they're going to be used. So this is the first slide where I try to motivate the definition of uniform processes in the next three slides. How do we think, what aspects of algorithms do I want to Capture. So an algorithm of a structure, or meaning from the primitives of the structure, computes a function or a partial function in that structure. Right? Remember, I'm including relations. It might try to decide a relation. So the first uh, idea here is that it uses the primitives uh, as oracles. Okay, that's an imagery that goes back to Kleene, and that's basically all it knows about that structure. It can ask the oracles for specific values, right? But it doesn't have a general view. So. To elaborate a little bit of this, we understand this to mean that in the course of a computation, whatever computations are, we won't go into that, of a value and some input, the algorithm may request from the oracle for any of the primitives, any particular value, for arguments which it must construct. In order to ask the question, it must give the arguments. And if the oracles cooperate and give answers to all the questions asked, then eventually the computation is completed in a finite number of steps, right? It's an almost trivial picture. Now the notion of a uniform process that I'm going to write in the next three slides attempts to capture in a very minimal way just these properties of this, make precise just this notion. It does not capture the effectiveness. I'm not going to have time to go into that, but if you have the natural numbers with zero and successor only, every function on them, all two the of node functions on them are computable by these processes that I'm going to talk about, right? So computability in any absolute sense is not caught 
the structure is caught, and that's enough for complexity. In fact, a lot of complexity results do not use effectiveness, as we all know. So there are three axioms, and the first axiom tells us what kind of an object these uniform processes are. A uniform process of i, t, n, and sort, right? Sort means the relation of function of a structure assigns to each substructure an n-ary partial function the same sort on that substructure. Right. I mean, the idea was that it computes on the whole structure, and it can ask oracles along the way. What I'm saying here, that the uniform process actually is defined on all substructures. The idea is, why would algorithms satisfy this? Is that you might have the oracles decide that we won't respond unless the question is about this substructure u. Right? That's a coherent notion, is what the claim is. And then the uh, algorithm will end up computing some partial function. Coherently, those that intuitively the computations can be done within the substructure A. Uh, so I'm going to be writing this as a notation. U satisfies or makes true that alpha of x is w uh, if the partial function is defined. This is just notation, but it'll help. OK, so the first thing is this localization tells us what kind of an object uniform processes are and nothing more. The second axiom is uh, where the byte is. If I have an NRE unary process, an NRE uniform process, and if I have two substructures of A and a homomorphism from one into the other, then the homomorphism respects the partial functions computed by the uniform process. In particular, taking the embedding of U into A, the partial function computed on every substructure by the process is a sub function of the partial function computed on all of A. The idea for this is that if you think about it, an algorithm and you have a computation, or for a model of computation, think about that. That's the idea in general, but it's actually the proof for particular computational models. Look at the computation of uh, alpha bar of x uh, in A, uh, I mean in U, right? You're trying to compute this. And every time you ask the oracle for a particular primary phi to give you the value, then the oracle gives you phi in V of pi of x. That takes computations, and this is a, an actual proof for models, but presumably it should be true in general. It will take computations from input x and transform them into computations from input pi of x that live in the corresponding uh, substructures. So that's the justification. It's a completely obvious thing if you have the identity embedding. If you have computations that have, uh, God forbid, like the ones that uh, were talked about uh, yesterday by um, uh, yours, yeah. yes, <laughs> by Dexter, uh, it is not as simple as that at all, right? You have to argue that every computation that's done from some input, the homomorphism gives you a computation uh, on the image, and that becomes very complicated, and it's absolutely essential that you have captured all the primitives. You have included all the primitives in your structure. You can't be, uh, you know, say I have addition as a primitive successor and predecessor of the ordinary you know, unary numbers, and then my machine knows how to multiply. Well, you know, you're obviously going to get things that are preserved by homomorphisms, right? Well, you know, that's a mistake that at least it used to be that. For example, a random access machine, as I'm sure a lot of people know, in the original <coughs> version at least, can check identity between two numbers in two steps. But identity between two numbers is not checkable in two steps if you try to do it. It's logarithm time. You can do random access machines, as they were originally defined, can do many, many more things. So if you want to apply this, to verify this for random access machines, you've got to put down all the primitives, right? as they are given. But once all the primitives are in, that becomes an obvious thing. The third one is much easier, the finiteness axiom. It says that if the partial function defined on R by the process at x converges and gives w, then there is a finite substructure which is generated by the input, and the process computing from that finite structure gives you the same input. And the idea is, I've already explained it, every call 
to the primitives if you collect all these calls into a finite substructure that does it. And it's generated by the input because in our imagery, you cannot ask a question of the oracle without giving it the arguments. So we write, again, the notation u computes, let's say partial function computes that the process at x gives w if it's finite generated by x and it verifies it. And there is this abstract notion of computation. Let me summarize these three axioms here because that's all there is to the uniform processes. The locality axioms is a uniform process assigns to each substructure of a, a partial function on the substructure. Uh, it respects homomorphisms and if it converges in the entire structure, then there is a finite substructure generated by the input where it converges. These are the actions. As I said, they do not ensure computability in any natural sense of the world, as we understand it, because, for example, in the natural numbers, in the unary numbers, with just zero successor and, let's say, predecessor, although you don't even need that, every function is computable this way. Uh, it's 12.15, I'd love to... Uh, I thought it was... Oh, yeah, okay, good. So, on the other hand, you can do complexity analysis for this. So let me try what kind of measures uh, I can uh, use. So let's start with a substructure norm. That's a function which assigns to each finite substructure generated by x a number. I'll give examples in one minute. But just imagine that for a minute. It's convenient to have the definition first. If you give me any substructure norm like this, then I can define for a process alpha the complexity with respect to this norm, the least in the sense of mu, uh, which is enough to compute. Right. So the examples would make it clear. Here is the cause that I used in the sample result before. Let's look at that a little more carefully. I have a process here, and I have a subset of the primitives. Again, think of the field, the real numbers, and this phi zero is only multiplication and division. You're not going to count equality tests. You're not going to count subtractions, subtractions or divisions. So the, the norm here, I haven't used the word new for that, is the size of the diagram of u restricted to phi zero. That's the number of calls to the oracles that are in phi zero. Number of calls, if you think of that, substructure is coming from an algorithm computing, right? So you look at the minimum of this such that u computes alpha x. Intuitively, that stands for the least number of calls to uh, primitives in phi zero that the process must do to compute. Well, as I said, but computations here are is neither here nor there. But if you start with random access machines with oracles, and you trace this down, that's exactly the natural norm that you would put on, the natural complexity measure that you would put on the random access machine for the number of calls it made to those primitives. Well, you may be counting the same call twice, the way complexity is usually here. We only count it once because we take the algebra, right? So it'll be less than or equal. It's the number of distinct calls to the primitives that are made by the machine, if you look at the coordinates here. Here's another measure which is not so common. I haven't seen it for algorithms. The least number of elements of the structure that the process must see to compute alpha of x. It's not a space complexity, it's different. But it comes up, so I wanted to mention it. This is the most interesting, and all the results in number theory are about this. It's the least depth of a substructure generated from x in which alpha of x can be computed. And what it means intuitively, or if you look at, at uh, how algorithms, actual algorithms are modeled here, it's a parallel measure. It's the least number of calls to phi zero. I did it for all of phi because it's not worth doing it for phi zero. I mean, we don't have results. The least number that must be done in sequence, right? So that's appropriate for parallel measures. And it's... Uh, it's quite easy to count and see that these measures are related this way. Now, there are many other complexity measures that can be computed. 
Not all complexity measures from algorithms can naturally happen this way easily. For example, space measures, you can do them, but you need to do some work, and they're very much tied up to the model because space is computed in different ways in different models. But these three suffice. In all these cases, I tried to explain it before, there are corresponding measures for real algorithms, real algorithms meaning specified by computation models, that if you carry through to the uh, uniform process that they determine, and you look at these definitions, this, there are measures of the same size, certainly for depth and for calls, and uh, these are just a little smaller, maybe, because they only count things once, right? So, another way of putting it is if I get lower bounds on these, then I can have as a theorem that the lower bounds apply to uh, all models, and I could also try to claim that some analysis may be done a little more carefully than I did today would apply to all algorithms. Now, this is the talk. It's in this slide. If we follow this slide carefully, uh, that's the whole talk. So, I have a function. And I have a, so it's in a, and I have a, so the function is I have an x where the function is defined, partial function, and I have a structure of A. A homomorphism from this substructure into A, it respects f and x. It's, first of all, it contains x and it also contains f of x. And it respects it in the same way we would expect for a homomorphism. Now I wish I had a drawing here, right? x and f of x are in here, pi of x, might be very far away from you, right? You may be here and pi of x is over there, okay? So that's the notion of respect. It's a very local notion. You only ask that it respects f at this point x. We say that the substructure forces that f of x is defined if every homomorphism from u into a respects f at x. And a substructure certifies that f of x is defined if it is finite, generated by x, and it forces. Now, the notations are a little, I mean, the notions are a little complicated when you first see them. Let me define the intrinsic complexity, then I'll try to justify them a little more. So for each of these substructure norms that I had, we assign numbers to finite substructures generated by x. I have a complexity measure now that's directly defined for the function f. No notions of algorithms or processes or what have you. We pick the least, the new least size of a certificate for x. And for example, in these cases, I have the intrinsic complexity calls complexity, the intrinsic size complexity, the intrinsic depth complexity. The word certificate I've borrowed from uh, von Pratt's proof of uh, the primality, all proof, when we were all very young here, uh, that primality is NP, right? I mean, von had this notion of a proof that a number P is prime, and the proofs are short, but there were exponentially many proofs, right? But you show that it's NP by checking, looking for a proof, choosing a proof, and then checking it. That's a proof theoretic notion, uh, which was what you needed to show that. Uh, the notion of a certificate is a more theoretic notion, but it's the same idea. It's a more theoretic notion, but it's the same idea. Suppose you have a certificate, suppose f of x is primality, right? And suppose you have a certificate in my sense here that a is a prime, right? What does that mean? It's a little substructure. Think of it as a neighborhood of a. I don't want to use topological notion because Intersections don't work here, right? It's a very bad topology. But think of a substructure, finite substructure generated by X as a, as a neighborhood of X. So if it's a certificate, it's a neighborhood of P, let's say, and P is a prime, what does that mean? That means that if I take any other Q, and if it has a neighborhood which is to begin with isomorphic with this, right? Then that Q must also be a prime. Because if it's isomorphic with this, the isomorphism is an embedding from here to there, and primality has to be respected, okay? It's stronger than that because it doesn't have to be isomorphic. It's enough for it to be a homomorphic image. So it's a very strong sense. And uh, the main thing about this slide is to emphasize it again, these definitions are given without any 
a reference to modeling of algorithms or anything like this. On the other hand, this is obvious directly from the definitions. If I have a uniform process which computes f, then the intrinsic complexity, no matter what the measure is, is less than or equal to the same complexity for the process. And if you bought before when I said that all algorithms can be modeled by processes like this, provided you identify all the primitives, then that means that this is an absolute lower bound for all complexities with respect to this view that you get if you use any kind of model of computation or ideally any algorithm. The second thing is that we also have a way of computing it, right? We don't forget all about algorithms, computations. It's enough to produce homomorphisms that don't respect. To get a lower bound for the intrinsic complexity, it's enough to comp uh, find enough homomorphisms. And, uh, well, so I won't bother to read that here, but that's just the contrapositive of the definition of, of uh, the certification process. So this comes directly from the action of homomorphism for processes. They have to respect every embedding. So if I pick uh, the notion of certification, I get immediately that a function computed by a process has this thing. And then we go ahead and we start computing lower bounds by constructing embedding. So let me give you first the nicest result, which is one of these results with Van den Dries. Uh, so here's the result. It's in two papers in various forms. Suppose I have a quadratic Erasmus. It's about co primeness. From these primitives, you are allowed division, both the quotient and the remainder function and you're allowed plus and minus. I'm working on the natural numbers here to stay close to recursion theory. Of course, the more natural would be to work with Z, but then you have real subtraction, but anyway. And you can have any number of Presburger functions, piecewise linear functions, functions definable in additive arithmetic, that these things don't change, the constants change. So there is, so I want to get, we want to get a lower bound on co-primeness here, so the intrinsic complexity, and the result is that if I have any quadratic irrational, the greater than one is just, it's just to simplify the formulas. Then, the, and A, B is what is known as a good approximation of C, then the depth uh, of coprimeness at A, B is greater than or equal to log log A, okay? And of course, the particular examples here, this good approximations, they're always infinitely many, C is irrational, doesn't have to be quadratic, or even algebra, doesn't have to be an algebraic number. But uh, if you take it the square root of two, you can have the pale pairs or the other uh, approximation that you can get from the continuous fraction expansions. And if you take the, the golden mean, then the successive uh, Fibonacci numbers are uh, good approximations of the golden mean. So another way of putting it, it's particularly interesting for Fibonacci numbers because that's where the Euclidean has its worst performance, right? In Fibonacci numbers, the Euclidean uh, actually uh, attains logarithms, k minus one divisions it has to do. Fibonacci numbers are, so to speak, an obstacle also, successive Fibonacci pairs for coprimers, no matter what algorithm you use according to this theory, right? The only problem is that it's just log log A, right? The Euclidean is log A. Well, one log away, that's a terrible lower bound, right? One log away in this. However, when I gave this result once in a talk, what was it, three years ago at Lix, uh, Pratt, who keeps uh, coming back into the subject, was in the audience, and you know, the same morning he constructed an algorithm which is not deterministic. It's a very simple algorithm, a variation of the Euclidean, where you can do three things each time. You either do what the Euclidean does, or you can do one of two other things. And so it behaves, if we look at the non-deterministic complexity the way we should, the best uh, run, it's no worse than the Euclidean, because you can always follow the Euclidean, right? But if you apply it to successive Fibonacci's, then it's a log log. Now, all this uh, talk about algorithms specifying or determining <coughs> processes and therefore these results applying to them, non-deterministic algorithms, no problem, right? No problem. It's, uh, 
if they're covered, that's not. So what does that mean? Well, uh, Pratsa Nukli, as uh, one likes to call it, shows that for this. I'm sorry? You made up that name, didn't you? No, I didn't. Oh, did I make it up? <laughs> That's not arguable. <laughs> it's a beautiful, I, I, I said the algorithm is very simple. That's true. The proof uses a lot of things about the Fibonacci that I had to learn that Vaughn obviously learned when he was very young, which is why he could do that so quickly and very impressively. It means that from this hypothesis, uh, we have the best result, right? If you try to get a lower bound on intrinsic complexity, which will cover all non-deterministic recursive programs, in particular, uh, you can't do better than log log, because here's an example, because on that hypothesis, it would cover the Fibonacci's, and on the Fibonacci's, Pratt has a log log algorithm, right? So within a constant, it's best possible. That other we get there is, I think, depends on, if, if you don't have any extras there, no Psi's, that R is one-tenth, you come out with numbers here, it's, it's very nice, concrete arithmetic. I'm not sure what that means. I still think that, in, uh, that the Euclidean is in probably more than one way is optimal. But that would be my guess. It could be that it's optimal in a very simple sense, you give me any algorithm, think of models that you know if you don't like talk about abstract algorithms, but you give me any algorithm, there is an infinite set in which it can't do better than the Euclidean. Maybe it's as simple as that. It's just that we've got the wrong proof, right? That infinite set is not going to be successive Fibonacci. Uh, because the successive Fibonacci is Pratt can beat you. The most exciting thing would be if there is all hell for deterministic algorithms. Now there is a rather trivial notion of deterministic uniform process. So we can phrase that as a conjecture. That would be an extremely interesting result because it would show the difference between determinism and non-determinism at this sub-logarithmic stage. Uh, but I know, I don't know how to prove anything about deterministic processes. I mean, it is, for these processes that we have, there uh, is a whole theory. Uh, there's a lot of facts, and I think we have a very good understanding of them, but for deterministic ones, I don't. But anyway, I think I have, I'll take two more minutes. Oh. Let me just, without explaining anything, show this result. Suppose you only are interested in algorithms which operate on n-bit numbers, no more. In the whole computation, it's going to have to take place within the n-bit numbers. This is very common uh, in complexity theory circuit. Uh, complexity is based on this idea, and the motivation is that the computer can only deal with numbers up to a certain size. The notions that we have make perfectly good sense because it was never claimed that the structures have to be infinite. Now, the interest here is that, you see, if you only have, if your structure has no more than two to the n elements, and you try to compute the intrinsic complexity of something in there, you have to produce embeddings. There is only so much room to produce these embeddings, right? So the proofs become a little more difficult, not more difficult, but the main thing is the lower bound we get now is on the size and not, it's the same as before, this log n is log log of 2 to the n, but it's a little bound on the size rather than the depth. I have not, and it's open whether it works for the depth, and I don't really know what that means. That has to be compared with algebraic complexity. Okay, so now I'm going to take the next two, I have two more minutes, I think, according what? Well, I don't need six. I want to say, give this one example in algebra. Uh, the very first problem uh, in uh, algebraic complexity, uh, going back to Mochkin in the 50s, was polynomial evaluation. You want to compute the value of that polynomial. Everything is in some field F. It's a function of n plus two variables. And uh, if you do it naively, you need a lot of operations, but there's this Horner's rule here is the recursion that gives them. Uh, so one addition and one multiplication reduces it to a polynomial of degree n minus one. So Horner's rule allows you to compute the value of any polynomial of a field over a field using no more than n multiplications and n additions, right? Now it could be that allowing divisions might help because of formulas like this. Uh, so the lower bounds, which were the first lower bounds obtained in, 
in algebraic complexity, as far as I know, allow division. So here's the basic result. It was proved by Pan. Uh, I've mentioned Winograd here partly because I'm following some of Winograd's methods in the next the slide. I'm not going to do the proofs, but behind the proofs are methods from Winograd's papers. And that is a much static problem. They have an ad hoc notion of computational model, which is the custom in algebraic complexity. Of course, in all cases that I've seen, it's the correct model. That's where the problem lives, right? And so, but they don't even allow conditionals here. Anyway, every straight line algorithm from the real field operations requires at least n multiplications, divisions, no matter how many addition subtractions, and at least n addition subtractions, no matter how many multiplications, divisions, to compute the value of the polynomial degree n. When, in the so-called generic case, when AX are algebraically independent. Now, the result is much more general than this, but I'm not going for generality here, right? I mean, it has nothing to do with real numbers. It works for complexes. It works for infinite fields and things like that, but uh, in the fields with some hypothesis. But uh, so, OK, uh, so we look at the corresponding relation again. I call it nullity, zero testing, whatever you call it. You're now only going to ask if that polynomial is zero as a relation of the coefficients in x. Right? And you're in the field, you have the field primitives, the same primitives you have in Horner's rule. How many operations would you have to do? And as I said about compriminess and, uh, and uh, uh, the GCD, this is theoretically an easier problem. So here's the theorem. So here's the field of real numbers. And of course, we're going to need equality to test that. Let's take the degree to be non-trivial and the input algebraically dependent. That's a generic case. So there are four results depending on how you do that. If you only count how many multiplications and divisions you're going to need, and you allow yourself an arbitrary number of plus, minus, and equality tests, you're going to need n. If you want to count how many equality tests you need, you're going to need n plus 1. That's exactly Horner's rule. That means you can't do better than Horner's rule, right? I'll give the credits in a minute. This in the, yeah. Things become much more interesting if you don't want to count multiplication and division, you want to count additions and subtractions. That's because, you know, if you count additions and subtractions and you don't count multiplication, uh, x to the 17th is simpler than x squared plus x, right? I mean, there's a whole, whole theory of field is based on analyzing polynomial where we count the degrees in multiplication. When you try to count additions, you get different normal forms. So the mathematics becomes a little different. This looks a little peculiar. There's an algorithm that will do this. Try it. You allow yourself as many identity tests as you can, and as long as the field does not have characteristic tools, not just the reals, you only need n minus 1. So for example, for degree 1, to check whether a plus bx is 0, you don't need any additions or subtractions. Right? OK. And then the last one is, uh, in some sense, the most unsatisfying, because it doesn't match with Horner's rule. If you want to count the tests, then the lower bound, the identity test, the lower bound is n, intrinsic complexity is n, uh, and there is a process that does that, but it's not an algorithm, it's not effective. Uh, so this results, there were special cases to uh, Dürer, Bergeser, Lichtaik, and Schub, uh, and they're not exactly like this because they count things a little differently, but it's basically the same result, uh, basically the same results they are proved by constructing beddings which don't respect the zero in these cases or the non-zero. Okay? And I'm going to end by just flashing by you the lemma for the most interesting case, just to see what's involved mathematically. The lemma that you need is in the generic case, you're in the reals. If these are positive reals and I take all the roots, K is the algebraic reals. Anyway, it goes down, but under some hypothesis from every finite substructure generated by x and z and roots and all that, there is a homomorphism that has certain properties. They look like that. And the 
point of showing this is that this is a case where these are not one to one, because we're counting the quality tests. So this whole theory was created for embedding first, certainly in my papers with uh, Van den Dries. Uh, they were one to one, and the mathematics is considerably, the technicalities are considerably easier. Here, when you try to count uh, equalities and inequalities, uh, this pi, for example, is homomorphism. It actually collapses some things in the structure and it was necessary to go there. I don't know how far this theory goes. Uh, it does create these interesting questions about, uh, particularly the ones about determinism and not determinism at a low level. Uh, it's hard to test it in number theory because there are so few lower bounds known. We just about covered them already with these two or three results that we have, not the only one I mentioned, but the others. And in algebraic uh, complexity, there are whole books, and it'll show if it's useful or not. Thank you very much. That's all I want to say. Uh, have you looked at uh, one of the Boolean operations as a source of uh, lower bounds of drug complexity? You mean a particular examples for problems? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's quite a rich area. So I haven't looked in Boolean algebra at all. Right. For example, multiplying Boolean matrices. Oh. Uh, the problems of multiplication of matrices, I think the answer is I have looked at it and I don't know the mathematics yet. There's a standard conjecture that to multiply two n by n matrices, you're going to need at least n square multiplication. That's why right. it's standard so problem. Out that if you restrict yourself to, oh, it's, it's a monotone uh, thing if you're doing uh, Boolean matrix multiplication. So okay. if you restrict yourself to monotone operations. So that becomes maybe easier. I haven't looked at all in Boolean algebra. We looked a little bit at fields, which is very recent, the field is last fall, basically, and the number theory. And then, then uh, Rasbrov has uh, even uh, richer results where he gets exponential lower bounds. <laughs> this method is not going to give exponential lower bounds. The mathematical reasons for that, it's low. So low, I should learn the exponential lower bounds. I know I can't match them, but for this. So, yeah. Uh, there's a model of um, Adamek et al., which is very similar to your model. Uh, they, they don't, they're not worried about uh, complexity of operations, but they do have the same uh, kind of recursive structure, except uh, on the left side, on the domain side, they're not using a partial subalgebra, but a coalgebra. So they use the destructive uh, structures of the coalgebra to break down the input to figure out how to do the recursive calls, and it's a coalgebra with the same signature as the algebra. And you do the recursive calls, and then you use an algebra to put the results from the recursive calls back together. And this is a very general definitional principle, not just a computational principle, but uh, for uh, they show that you can use it for lots of they give lots of examples of all. What is the aim? It's not complexity analysis. It's not complexity, but it's to model uh, recursive. Uh, stru oh, so that would be some kind of a dual of recursive program schemes. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of these results were, so I don't know it, I'll appreciate the reference. A lot of these results were first obtained in recursive program schemes, which I go back to McCarthy 1962, the work that should have been known better but isn't known. And I still think that in order to get really sharp things, uh, one probably would have to work analyzing recursion. Now, how poor recursion comes in, I don't know in complexity analysis at all. Uh, but this notion of, uh, of a uniform process, which is in fact categorical now, that <laughs> there is a categorical, it's a functor of some kind. So you can abstract, which means in some sense that it's sort of soft, right? Yeah, I mean, we get the easy Sedonic, results. The Sedonic model is, is categorical. Yeah, yeah. So it could be that they're related. It's <coughs> too fine to that. Yeah, I should look at that. I was going to ask whether this is the first abstract theory of complexity that there seems to be some. No, I, there is a lot. I used to give, you've heard me at Berkeley give a preliminary version of these results. I had no results in algebra two years ago. And I used to call these things the abstract algorithms, and the title of the lecture was something like an axiomatic derivation of uh, 
robust or absolute lower bounds. How can I change it because people think of that that it has to do something like abstract complexity measures and and it's not that. It's not that. But it is an axiomatic approach to obtaining lower bounds, it's just that it's tied to the mathematics in the subject. It's, and, the, and, and it it makes very clear what kind of complexity measures you can apply for. You have to be defined in terms of calls one way or the other. If you look in particular at the real number structure, uh, as you had it there, how does your theory relate to lump should snail? Yes, so I haven't seen that, I confess, because as I said, this is very, uh, very uh, recent. Uh, I had looked at it when they first when they first came up with it. My guess is it won't. I mean, there are some similarities in that you cannot do complexity analysis in algebra without assuming equality as one of the primitives, and you know it's not computable really on all the reals. So there are some similarities there in that the algebraic approach. But I know they have characterizations of NP and things like this, and once you do that, it's not covered by that. So what I'm doing is not going to cover NP over the reals. It may cover mm -hmm. NP over the natural numbers if your primitives allow you to start constructing the thing that you're searching for. But uh, these processes, and just as recursive program schemes over the reals, can never compute the square root of two over the reals, simply because you can't get it out of rational operations. So the quick answer which I probably should have given is I have not looked at that since I wanted a simple test that the so-called substitution method introduced by Pan and exploited by a whole lot of people is covered here. And that's all I've done in algebra. And so it's, it's, it's very early times yet. But I'm convinced that the substitution method is really an early version of this very specific to fields, to be sure. But it's, it's like the whole model. Just a small question of I mean, the substructure requirement seems to be very strong. And, uh, the homomorphism axiom, you mean? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I understand these are supposed to give you, the programs are supposed to give you, uh, you know, the, the way you define the process, it should would be a function defined of all substructures and it should agree with. To each substructure, it gives you a little partial function, it gives you an approximation of what you compute on the whole structure, yes. It's now, a little bit like a manifold. So the answer to what you want the output is some a value of some function, right? Yeah. What happens if the value is not in the substrate? No, no, then it's not defined the way I have it. Yeah, it's not defined. But that's not a limitation because you just add that point. That's that's not really I mean it's this is not a problem. The way this homomorphism maximum is used, you have to see it used to understand the idea, is you're checking whether uh, 5 uh, is co-prime to 8. And, uh, no, if it is you know, specific. you're going to get an embedding that's going to replace 5 by 2 billion and 13. And, uh, you know what I mean? I mean, it's the fact, it's the uniformity of the algorithm that is used. No matter where you go, you're going to have the same process, and this same process is defined to, in terms of homomorphisms. It's a very simple version of a classical logical thing that if you can't define, uh, if, if, a, if a relation is not preserved by homomorphisms, then it can't be defined in any, in any language. That's what. But, but for yes, no answers, I can see that. Yeah. But what, if you want an answer which is a value, Yes. How does this work in that? Oh, it works. Oh, yeah. No, no. It's easier than there are other methods. Yes. So I'm only looking in the context of functions on a structure to compute, right? Yes. Otherwise, I put the two structures together. Now, the fact that the value may not be on the substructure when you define a homomorphism axiom. Uh, it, it's not a restriction because you can just edit. So this particular U is not going to, uh, the function is still going to be defined on that U, but it'll be on a somewhat bigger U. It's, that's not a problem. 
There is one thing about abstract algorithms that everybody agrees on in algebra, and that is that if, uh, if you need at least k steps to construct the value, then whatever algorithms are, they will need at least k steps. Everybody, that's called the value depth complexity. If you just look at the depth of the term, and uh, there are a lot of results in algebra that use that. The best result I know is Vandenris, which is in our paper, but it's his result. He gets a, the best known lower bound for co-primeness where you allow, allow multiplication also. And it's a square root log log. And it uses no embeddings, nothing like this. He just shows that if you, uh, it's for GCD, not for co-primeness. I'm sorry, it's open for co-primeness. I misspoke. If you take A, a plus one and B, a and B is a pair pair. The GCD does not lie in a huge range. Uh, so you have other methods if you have a function that takes complicated values, uh, more coarse methods maybe. Uh, but, but this method applies perfectly well. There's no, it's just not needed as often. <laughs> 